back. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch. I am Sharona Hoffman. I'm a professor of law here at Case. I'm one of the co-chairs of this conference and the associate director of the Law Medicine Center. It is a great pleasure to introduce Professor Larry Gostin, who is our keynote speaker today. He is extremely prominent in the areas of law and public health, and I could probably spend the whole hour discussing his accomplishments, but I'll only mention a couple of things. Professor Gostin is the Associate Dean at Georgetown Law Center. He is also the John, the John Carroll Research Professor there. He is, in addition to that, a Professor of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University and a research fellow at Oxford University. And we're pr particularly grateful that he flew back just a couple of days ago from England in order to speak for us. Professor Gostin is associated with a number of very important organizations and look, works closely with them. These include the Institute of Medicine and the World Health Organization. He's been very, very active in law reform and in drafting model legislation, including the Model Emergency Health Powers Act, which I teach in my courses. And he has received a number of international awards. Professor Gostin is the author of many books and almost countless articles, I think, and it is a great pleasure to have him here with us. Thank you very much, Sharona and uh, Amos, uh, uh, Case Western Reserve Law School. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege and honor to be here. Um, I have to comment on today's proceedings because they're really highly innovative and it's, it's very refreshing um, in this field to actually see um, uh, academics, um, uh, uh, practitioners, uh, people in the field working together on an important problem. So it's very gratifying to be here with you and I thank you very much for having me. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in the first five years of the 21st century, uh, the United States and the rest of the world have experienced shocks, crises, and fears captured in the haunting images, words, and events that define our turbulent times. <clears throat> September 11th, Al-Qaeda, anthrax, weapons of mass destruction, smallpox, axis of evil, Saddam, SARS, quarantine, enemy combatants, USA Patriot, HIV AIDS, Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib, and avian influenza. The troubling lexicon that's entered our language in the 21st century captures, I think, the pressing dangers individuals, countries, and the international system face today. Some of these dangers are not new, um, such as war, tyranny, and torture. They represent recent manifestations of age-old threats to human dignity, national security, international peace. Other dangers combine, however, <clears throat> to create new threats to individuals, countries, and the global community that have few, if any, precedents in human history. This lecture looks at one of those new types of danger, the threat of infectious diseases and how, what it poses to human life, the security of states, and the international political and economic stability of the world. In short, the world confronts a serious biosecurity threat. My talk today is going to be taken from a book that I've written with David Fidler uh, for Stanford University Press that's forthcoming this year, um, looking at the question of biosecurity under the rule of law. Uh, in today's lecture, what I'm going to do is to define what we mean by biosecurity. Uh, we mean something old and something quite new and innovative by that term. Secondly, I'm going to discuss what are the um, really critical problems of biosecurity policy in the United States, 
with intergovernmental organizations like the World Health Organization and the international community. And then finally, I'm going to conclude uh, with a topical case study, a case study involving avian influenza, H5N1 um, virus, um, that is currently um, sweeping the globe and I think illustrates uh, many of the points that I want to make. <clears throat> Our concept of biosecurity recognizes a double helix of pathogenic threats that include dangers posed not only by man-made uh, risks of biological weapons, but also naturally occurring infectious diseases. Like intertwined strands of DNA, the threats presented by biological weapons and naturally occurring disease epidemics weave together to form an interdependent policy challenge, the likes of which we have never seen before. <clears throat> Our approach to biosecurity deviates from the traditional perspective in at least two ways. Under international law, traditionally, Threats of bio-warfare by one state against another were the predominant paradigm for thinking about security. But we go much further than this. We talk not just about bio-violence um, from one state to another, but bio-violence bio perpetrated by non-state actors, so-called bioterrorists. And the second uh, difference of how we use the term biosecurity is we believe that biosecurity encompasses not only intentional uh, threats, but also naturally occurring infectious diseases that threaten our global security in profound ways, our personal security, our health, our economic stability, um, and our political stability. As you all know, uh, the United States has, since September 11th, been engaged in what we call a homeland security project. This Homeland Security Project is an all-hazards approach to threats. Uh, it looks at conventional um, weaponry, um, such as explosives. It looks at nuclear um, uh, capabilities and devices, including a dirty bomb. It looks at chemical um, uh, exposures and, of course, biological exposures to dangerous pathogens. This includes, of course, bioviolence, um, and we have, I think, a significant vulnerability um, to intentionally, uh, intentional biological threats. Biological weapons um, are nearly as easy to develop and far more lethal than chemical weapons. They are also much less expensive than nuclear devices. The risk of detection is quite low, that is, uh, smuggling such devices into the United States or actually developing them within our borders. They also have enormous potential for harm. Just for example, uh, 10, 100 kilograms of anthrax spores of the kind uh, that were uh, introduced in the United States uh, in on Octo October um, uh, 2001 um, through the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, if that were uh, dispersed, upwind in a major city, it would cause between 130,000 to 3 million deaths. In other words, uh, bioviolence can be as deadly as a nuclear device. In fact, the Internet uh, and widespread use of information uh, on biological agents and technologies only increases this threat. Um, there is a dual-use nature of the scientific knowledge behind biological um, activities. Uh, one, of course, is quite legitimate and indeed critical to our understanding, which is uh, our continuing uh, research into um, uh, ongoing um, pathogens, uh, not only pathogens that are currently threatening us, but even pathogens that perhaps were eradicated, like smallpox. Um, that is one use and a legitimate use, but of course those same uses, those same uh, research endeavors can also be used for another quite illicit use, um, for the use of bioviolence by those who aim to destroy um, our culture and our democracy and our political stability. Uh, this dual use nature of, the, uh, of biological knowledge makes tracking unlawful activity 
monitoring it and sanctioning it much more difficult than it would otherwise be. We also know from a variety of tabletop exercises, not unlike the ones that you're undergoing now, uh, but tabletop exercises that were uh, being um, uh, 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 processed through the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Health and Human Services, and the Department of Justice. Tabletop exercises like Dark Winter, um, which simulated a smallpox attack, or Top Off 1 and Top Off 2, uh, which simulated a plague attack. Uh, these uh, simulations illustrated that we are woefully prepared um, for bioviolence. And indeed, uh, Trust for America's Health, one of the major um, uh, respected voluntary organizations in this country, uh, have given um, the federal government and most of the states Ds and Fs on their preparedness uh, report. Julie Gerberding, uh, uh, who's the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, has used a new term which I find is helpful. Um, she says we are now in the new normal. Um, what was once uh, terrifying to us uh, is now normal. Um, you only have to live in Washington, D.C. Um, between anthrax and the sniper and scares at every little moment um, to know that you just have to cope with this new normal reality. But we not only have to cope with uh, uh, bioviolence that is intentionally perpetrated, but also nationally, naturally occurring infectious diseases. Uh, there are uh, uh, many, many diseases that threaten us, and it was only in the 1970s uh, that the Surgeon General of the United States um, said it was time to close the book on infectious diseases. That was hubris, um, and it was wrong, um, because we will never be free of infectious pathogens uh, in uh, our lifetime or any lifetime in the future. There are continuing to be ancient, constant, and abiding diseases that kill, like malaria, tuberculosis, measles, acute respiratory or diarrheal infections that plague the earth. There are endemic diseases that have transformed into multidrug-resistant form that makes them hard to defeat scientifically. Things like multidrug-resistant tuberculosis or drug-resistant forms of HIV-AIDS infection. Third world diseases, that is diseases that were once um, fairly uh, confined to third world countries, um, have now moved to the first world. Things like West Nile virus and monkeypox. And there are a host of emerging infectious diseases that are affecting uh, less developed and more developed countries. Uh, hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, um, SARS, uh, and avian influenza. All of these diseases pose devastating consequences for world health, world trade, and tourism. Uh, in our Stanford University Press book, uh, we uh, identify a number of what we call conundrums. Uh, that is, uh, problems that are vital to understanding biosecurity policy, which we've not begun as a nation or a global community to struggle with. I'm only going to mention three of those um, vital problems, um, but I think they will be illustrative. One is the need to integrate security and public health policy. <clears throat> the second is the need to supervise science um, for uh, public health and security purposes. And the third is to develop a robust biosecurity policy under the rule of law. First, integrating security and public health. The worlds of security and public health um, for many generations now have been a collision of two different worlds, two different worlds of different policy and different governance systems. Uh, and what they show, I think, is, is that one, uh, security has been always fought out in the realm of high politics, the Department of State, the United Nations, and the like. Uh, and the other uh, was always in the realm of low politics, um, public health. Security, of course, national security, global security, is the stuff of high politics, international relations, 
national security. These things are highly funded, they're highly influential, they're highly political. They also have uh, certain modes of operation that are very foreign to public health. They are essentially closed, um, that is decisions are made um, in uh, behind closed door doors. Uh, the scientific and research agenda is largely secretive and operations are often clandestine. Um, one can see that um, with many aspects of CIA, FBI, Homeland Security, Department of State, and the like. Public health, on the other hand, is much different. In many ways, public health um, is phobic of national security and police. It doesn't believe that it serves a policing function, even though it exercises police powers. It is clearly in the realm of low politics. Um, it is much more a technical, non-political, humanitarian pursuit. Um, its modes of operation, rather than being secretive, are explicitly open, uh, explicitly scientific. The gap between public health and international security in the United States and internationally is enormous. Uh, security uh, never or, or until recently ever had considerations of public health in mind. In fact, I, one story I like to tell in public health audiences, it may not go down as well here, um, but when they had a, a major uh, federal simulation um, and uh, FBI, C uh, uh, CDC, um, uh, uh, Homeland Security, and state and local health departments got together for a simulation, uh, when the health commissioner for a large state came in to the table, um, the uh, person from the FBI asked her to go out and get donuts, um, which I thought was a, a very good um, illustration of what they thought of public health. Um, the late 20th century, however, have begun to <coughs> ring many, many changes in this separation between security and public health. The security community have become to see the critical importance of public health in everything they do. It began with HIV AIDS when Colin Powell announced that this that HIV AIDS uh, pandemic was a national security threat to the United States. It continued certainly with SARS, um, with um, President Bush becoming um, uh, very um, active in that uh, response. Certainly with the anthrax attacks, um, with the importance of communicating uh, between CDC, public health, and security. And then, of course, most recently, terrorism, um, smallpox vaccination campaign, and the various bioterrorism um, uh, events. What we need, of course, is a seamless integration of these two worlds, which is what we don't have. Public health must become more political. It must enter the realm of high politics. It must be prepared to collaborate more with security and police forces. Uh, it needs to be more conscious of national security aspects. One illustration of this, I think, is the national uh, campaign to vaccinate 500 healthcare workers with smallpox. Um, President Bush um, went to the CDC and state health departments and said, this is a national security problem. I want at least uh, a half a million of first responders and healthcare workers vaccinated uh, within the year. Uh, and I recall very vividly that those in public health simply resisted it. They were unused to having a high political figure tell them what to do. They were not prepared to um, see smallpox as a uh, public health threat because it had been eradicated and they fought the president every step of the way. Uh, as a result, of course, uh, the president's plan was never implemented. Uh, we uh, spent a great deal of funding um, and, and have vaccinated only a very small fraction, probably about one-tenth of what the president had wanted. I think it turned out that public health was probably right about that, that there was a very low risk. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, they were, uh, there was a request, an order indeed, by the Commander-in-Chief, and public health uh, did not see it within its purview. Um, security, on the other hand, needs to be much more um, open to public health. Uh, it needs to embrace scientific methods. It needs to be more open in its research. 
uh, it needs to um, rely on a very strong public health infrastructure. Uh, now, I want to mention a few reasons why I think um, the United States has uh, gotten all of this um, badly wrong. And one of the reasons is that I think that what we do is look at a disease du jour. Rather than focusing on a very strong, stable public health infrastructure uh, that has a strong capacity um, for um, surveillance, um, modern data systems, a well-trained, adequate workforce, um, good leadership, good connection to political um, channels. Uh, instead, what we've done is we've focused on the particular disease of the day, um, whether the disease is um, anthrax, smallpox, SARS, um, avian influenza. We've channeled all of our resources into those narrow diseases rather than a broad strengthening of the infrastructure. The second um, uh, conundrum in biosecurity policy I want to talk about is uh, related to what I've already mentioned, which is the need to supervise science for security and public health. Again, we see a very substantial collision between the public health and security worlds, two different cultures. Public health has prized issues of scientific innovation, scientific freedom, open dissemination of scientific results, while security has resisted restricted science, believing that it can be a security threat, has tried to supervise science, and has been against open disclosure. Somehow these two worlds need to come together um, to find a way to make science act in the interests of both public health and security in the United States and globally. And the third uh, conundrum is the conundrum of biosecurity under the rule of law. Uh, this is a major problem, and frankly, it's uh, tearing our country apart at the moment. Um, you can see it on the front pages of the newspapers every day. Um, you can see it um, when we look at uh, the war in Iraq. You can see it when we look at um, uh, our, uh, 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 our investigation of, uh, uh, of strategies for pandemic influenza. Um, you can literally see it everywhere. Um, I saw it personally. Um, Sharona uh, mentioned the model Emergency Health Powers Act. Well, after 9-11, um, the CDC asked my center to draft um, a statute to modernize public health law, and we did that, and we thought that we had had um, quite considerable um, safeguards of uh, individual rights and individual liberties. But it literally um, uh, was on the front pages tearing people apart with the political right were against it because it was a... Uh, somehow affected economic freedoms. The political left was against it because it affected civil liberties. And even though we tried to embed a very strong sense of individual rights and liberties and protection of economic interests into strong, robust public health and security policies, nonetheless, um, we were politically very much divided. And I think the reason for that is that the Model Emergency Health Powers Act um, got caught in the high politics of Homeland Security Project um, of the Bush administration. Uh, and we know how uh, controversial that is. Um, think of um, how we struggled over how to define or to restrict uh, or supervise um, in interrogations in Abu Ghraib and uh, Guantanamo Bay and our view about uh, inhuman integrating treatment and torture. Think about the uh, national security agencies um, spying without a warrant and how we have um, all as a country disagreed. Think about the recent case that was argued before the Supreme Court uh, about habeas corpus and what habeas corpus means to our constitutional tradition. Uh, think about secret military tribunals or extraordinary renditions uh, in all of these um, security spheres, uh, there is this debate about how far we can go to protect the country in the name of public health and national security, while at the same time maintaining the very freedoms and civil liberties that we're fighting to protect. 
So our conception of biosecurity under the rule of law is, is that there are at least two overarching reasons to abide by the rule of law in our security and public health policies. Um, one of them is normative. Um, if, we, if we give up our constitutional freedoms in the name of security, um, then we have succumbed to exactly the kind of destabilization that terrorism seeks to achieve. Uh, and so as a normative matter, uh, it is quite essential, I think, for us to maintain um, our strength, uh, and our strength is in our Constitution. The second reason is a consequential one. Um, in some ways, I think, abiding by the rule of law can increase our security. It increases our security uh, because it uh, makes sure that our political actors um, uh, abide by real risks, that they use um, uh, procedural due process to uncover uh, facts um, that are accurate and true. But having said that, I think consequentially, the rule of law can protect uh, national security. I am not naive about this. I know that uh, in real politique, uh, sometimes there are really serious and un inalterable trade-offs between, on the one hand, um, public health and security, and the other uh, individual rights and individual interests. And sometimes one needs to bend a little for the other. And I think both sides uh, need to be prepared at times to bend, um, but never to break. Um, that is to say, I don't believe ever um, that we should make ourselves completely vulnerable um, to uh, threats um, in the name of the rule of law, but nor do I think we should give up the rule of law in the name of security, that we need to find a right balance. Uh, what I mean by the rule of law um, is quite specific because there are too many people, in my view, that wrap themselves in the rule of law, uh, and in fact, uh, usually on both sides of a political debate, each side will claim um, that it's abiding by those principles. What I mean is, is that executive power uh, must be authorized um, by the legislature. Um, we, we went through this under, with the hearings of uh, Justice Alito uh, and the idea of a uni uni unified uh, executive uh, and the importance of uh, trying to rein in executive powers. Uh, I mean by it, secondly, that we need to protect individual rights and liberties like autonomy, uh, liberty, privacy. I mean that we need to follow um, uh, procedural due process uh, whenever we deprive people of their interests. I mean that we need to have a robust understanding of distributive justice, that is, um, allocating benefits and burdens of policies and services in ways that are fair and equitable. This is a lesson, I think, that we were taught very strongly uh, with the Gulf Coast hurricanes. And then finally, what I mean by the rule of law uh, is, is that uh, governance needs to be transparent and accountable. Having said all this, I recognize that our governance strategies, both governance strategies nationally and internationally, because we know that the World Health Organization has recently adopted the international health regulations, which, which have both security and public health implications. Uh, but both the WHO and the United States and other uh, member states of WHO um, have to f cope with the problem of scientific uncertainty. I think SARS gives us a really good example of that. What SARS showed us is, is that we had the potential for rapid spread of an infectious diseases uh, throughout society. Uh, yet we didn't know the etiological agent of SARS. We now know it's the SARS coronavirus. We didn't know how to test for it. We didn't know how to treat it. We had no vaccine. In other words, we were set back to a pre-therapeutic uh, era. Uh, and when security forces or public health needs to act under conditions of scientific uncertainty, um, it is very troubling. Because if they act um, meekly, uh, and it turns out that the threat was all too real, um, they will be held accountable for not doing enough. And yet if they overreact um, and they are too repressive of individual liberties, um, then they are um, accused of being authoritarian. Um, so in some ways, uh, governance policy has a hard, hard time of trying to 
accommodate um, the deep problems of acting under conditions of uncertainty. I want to end now with a case study about uh, influenza A, H5N1. Uh, I think uh, in many ways uh, this case study will illustrate much of what I have said. It takes place in the context of a naturally occurring infectious disease, but it certainly has very many of the same security implications of um, bioviolence. As you know, H5N1 is now endemic in Southeast Asia um, with very serious outbreaks occurring in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. Uh, modeling studies have shown us that, it, that this virus will certainly have a global reach, um, whether through mechanisms of international commerce, migratory birds, um, or a highly mobile population. Um, the virus is certain to come to all other continents, including North America. Uh, we also know that uh, historically, every century sees three to four pandemics of flu um, per century. In the 20th century, there was the Spanish flu in 1918, the Asian flu in 57, Hong Kong in 68, and then a, 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 not a pandemic, but what was thought to be one, the swine flu in 76. Uh, recently, scientists found that uh, the H5N1 virus that's circulating around the globe at the moment uh, is actually a genetic match for uh, the uh, 1918 influenza virus. That was um, thought to be the worst pandemic in the history, at least the modern history of mankind. It killed uh, between 20 to 50 million people. Uh, most epidemiologists think that it was 50 million people in a world that was much, much smaller than it is today. Um, it affected one out of every seven um, uh, uh, healthy adults. Uh, and currently, uh, the H5N1 virus has uh, achieved three out of the four prerequisites that the Institute of Medicine see as being necessary for a flu pandemic. Um, it is a novel, highly pathogenic strain. It has, it has efficient animal-to-animal -animal animal -animal transmission. It has been transmitted um, uh, from human to human. Um, and uh, finally, um, what has not occurred, and the only thing that has not occurred, is that there has not been efficient human-to-human -human transmission. But what, would ha what could, that could happen easily um, if uh, there were what is either a natural mutation of the virus or else uh, uh, what, what is called um, a, a genetic mixing, um, so that if somebody had the animal strain and also the human strain of influenza, they would mix genetics um, and form a highly efficient uh, form of human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, model, people who have modeled uh, 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 H5N1 say that if, if it was at its worst, uh, a massive global event would uh, kill 142 million, uh, and it would cost a $4.4 trillion loss from our gross domestic product um, globally. Uh, the WHO and, and HHS strategic plans devote over 90% of resources to medical countermeasures. Um, 6.7 billion was proposed by the White House. Congress has recently um, given something around 3.5 billion, um, most again to vaccines and antiviral medications. Uh, but it's likely that these vaccines and antiviral medications will be extremely scarce. Uh, vaccines um, are uh, very, very difficult, not just for um, influenza, but generally speaking. Um, there are many market disin disincentives to vaccine manufacturers, high investment costs, limited or variable markets, um, uh, uh, multiple regulatory compliance in the United States, Europe, and Asia. Um, just to give you an example, in 1967, there were 26 manufacturers across the globe of influenza vaccine. By, by 2006, by today, there are only four manufacturers. In the United States, there are only two manufacturers. One of these manufacturers uh, is exclusively for intranasal flu, which is not effective against um, uh, uh, highly pathogenic strains. So in effect, if there were um, a pandemic, the United States would be very badly prepared. The Institute of Medicine has recommended, and I support, a national vaccine authority and to try to develop rapidly 
a number of vaccines, not just influenza, but a variety of vaccines that threaten our health and security. There are multiple legal problems, and I realize not everyone here are, uh, is a lawyer, and so I'll just go quickly here, and if you don't understand, it's my fault. Um, one is the intellectual property problem. Uh, with uh, influenza uh, vaccines, as you know, we, we develop vaccines through egg-based technologies. Well, with, if you have a highly pathogenic strain, then it kills the egg usually, and so you can't develop it. So we have to make it possible for using eggs, uh, egg technology um, to buy a process of reverse genetics. Reverse genetics, of course, is a patented um, a technology, and so we would need to overcome this for rapid production of influenza vaccine. We, what is much better than egg-based technologies are cell-based technologies. If we could develop cell-based technologies for influenza and other forms of vaccines, we would have a much greater capacity for, for rapid ramp-up of vaccine supply um, and antigen supply. Um, the problem is, of course, again, is that cell-based technologies are patented, um, and so we would run into that difficulty. Uh, many of you have heard of Tamiflu, um, which is thought to be partially effective if given very early in, 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 in a cycle of influenza. Um, but um, there are problems with Tamiflu, um, uh, and the, one of the main problems is, is that Hoffman LaRoche has a patent until 2016, um, and the United States has thought about what it's called compulsory licensing under TRIPS, which is a major World Trade Organization agreement, um, that would um, allow us um, to produce Tamiflu without the patent holder's um, permission. Um, uh, Hoffman LaRoche has uh, actively um, resisted this, and at the moment it would be very unlikely without some kind of compulsory licensing <laughs> arrangement for us to have sufficient stockpiles of Tamiflu um, to be effective. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services and, uh, and, and the World Health Organization have come up with plans for ethical allocation of scarce resources of uh, vaccines and uh, antiviral medication should there be um, a uh, flu pandemic. I've been working uh, on the WHO plan, um, and I don't have time to really go into uh, this um, uh, carefully about how you would ethically allocate these provisions, but they might have something to do with uh, targeting for prevention and public health, to maintain scientific and medical functioning, to maintain critical infrastructures, um, for, um, to provide treatment for those who are most in need of it. But there are two aspects of fair allocations that I've uh, really feel that are quite important and that have been missed from the HHS um, uh, uh, study. Uh, one is the question of social justice, um, because if you look at the HHS plan, you will see that mostly high-status, high-import workers um, would have first grabs at uh, a vaccine and treatment. Uh, and what we learned from Hurricane Katrina, I think, uh, is, is that unless you pay particular attention um, to the vulnerable, to the disabled, to the poor, to the elderly, um, that um, there will be uh, very prominent questions of um, social justice. Uh, we also have extreme problems of global justice with very severe uh, inequities between poor and rich countries. And then finally, um, I believe that it's extremely important um, in thinking about ethical allocation to have civic engagement. The Institute of Medicine is currently going around the country, and it's actually asking people, what do you think would be a fair way of allocating scarce vaccines and scarce treatment? And this may or may not surprise you, but to a high level of consistency, the average general public says that they would be altruistic, that they, that is, they, they would be prepared to forego vaccine for themselves so that others may have them. For example, the elderly were willing to give it to the young. But my own view is, is that in the real world of vaccine allocation, people will not be so unselfish. 
Um, there will be hoarding, black marketeering, and the like. There already is with Tamiflu. Go on the internet and you'll see that the well-connected and are already um, stockpiling this. So in short, I think that the public will be Will, will agree to fair allocations if they believe the government will allocate fairly, which is not necessarily the case. Um, I don't have time to go into a wide variety of um, public health interventions, um, uh, uh, such as isolation and quarantine and international travel and border control um, and uh, increasing social distance, which are important interventions. Uh, NPR is probably going to do a, a program on this on Tuesday, and I'll I have a short commentary there. So if you want to pick up the speech on Tuesday, you can you you, you can then. But I don't have time to do it now. Um, I think all I, all that I would say is is that uh, w when you have a variety of interventions that are on the table, like international travel and border controls or prevention of people from mixing publicly. Uh, or isolation or quarantine, or as President Bush has suggested as a possibility, the use of the military um, for quarantine. Uh, we need to recognize that these are extreme measures, that they require rigorous safeguards. And whatever we do um, on biosecurity policy, whether the policy is in, in confronting security or intentional bioviolence or naturally occurring infectious diseases, the government cannot be successful unless it gains the public trust. And it gains that public trust by acting transparently in accordance with the principles of the rule of law and the principles of social justice. Bioviolence and pandemics can be highly socially divisive events. And the political community must respond in a way that reflects profoundly in the kind of society that we, the United States, aspire to be. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Tamiflu, in India, what they did is, this was something which was with Roche. And they, uh, this was something they didn't allow to be licensed to any Indian firm or they weren't supplying in India. And since the epidemic proportions were already reached, Indian government with under a provision in their patent act where they can bypass a patent in view of a public emergency, public health emergency. Now this kind of a provision we already have in US patent act regarding nuclear inventions. Now, this is something which can be thought about. And I think Indian government did it with their patent act. That's exactly right. Um, uh, a, a lot of the um, issues about um, access to affordable medications have, uh, have been part of um, the HIV um, AIDS <laughs> problem um, with antiretroviral medications, um, but it's gone beyond that, and there have been some very innovative approaches. Uh, India is certainly one. Um, uh, Brazil um, has been very active in this area as well, as is South Africa. Uh, the problem is, uh, in the United States, um, there is such a strong political commitment to maintaining the viability of the pharmaceutical industry that politically it's much more difficult to reach a cardinal rule of world trade, which is protection of intellectual property rights. It's very, very hard to do in the U.S. And of course, if you're looking at places uh, like developing countries in Africa and Asia, they don't have the domestic capability of an India or a Brazil, uh, and so they're simply not able to do it. But I do, I have used uh, uh, India and Brazil uh, and South Africa as illustrations in other talks I've given as very interesting uh, ways of approaching this problem. You needn't be shy.
here. Please refresh my history lesson on, on the Spanish flu. That was very highly contagious from person to person, correct? Okay. Correct. And you said that the Asian strain of H5N1 highly pathogenic avian influenza then is a genetic match for Spanish flu? Yes. It's not an exact match, but it's genetically derived from Spanish flu. Okay. So it is not an exact match. And I would just wanted to make that difference difference and it's important because highly pathogenic avian influenza has not found a way to transmit efficiently from person to person which is pandemic flu and and I wanted to just make that distinction and make sure that I understood you correctly um, because of the human to human transmission of, of that virus so it's related but it is not the same correct okay thank you I like your observations about government agencies and, and what they need to do uh, regarding response to this, but can you give a sort of a quick summary of which government agencies you think are, are dropping the ball the most? And, and for instance, like CIA, FBI, um, uh, you know, the scientific agencies, what they could be doing that they're not doing right now um, to, to be better uh, able to respond to this? Oh, well, I know you can spend hours on that, yeah. but a very short one. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's. Um, I mean, there are mul there, I mean, there are multiple. I mean, uh, multiple problems that uh, that I think uh, all of all of us all of us can see. Um, uh, we saw, for example, uh, in uh, Homeland Security. Uh, I have I have a lot of. I, I suppose if I if if you force me to point to one agency that troubles me the most, it would be Homeland Security. Um, I think. Uh, I think that agency was um, uh, was was wrong at its inception. Uh, I think it was it was it was the idea that if you um, uh, consolidate and bureaucratize, uh, that somehow you you become more efficient. And I think what we found is that that were they were less efficient. Um, uh, FEMA FEMA's performance uh, in uh, 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 after Hurricane Katrina, I think uh, might very well reflect uh, the performance of CDC and public and state and local public health agencies after an equivalent um, uh, infectious disease attack. Uh, I, most people in public health believe that uh, the uh, that Homeland Security and the uh, has uh, harmed public health capacity; uh, that it's diverted resources to different places. Um, I didn't. Re I, I, attend, I intended to talk a little bit about what we consider to be the dual-use fallacy. Um, when, I, when I talk um, uh, at the Department of Health and Human Services or the Department of Homeland Security or in Congress, um, I, th there are two things that tend to happen. First, in Congress, in congressional hearings, um, there's one question that's always asked of me more than anything else, which is the who's in charge question. And it's very, very difficult to answer that about who, who is in charge. Um, at the same time, when I talk to Homeland Security and, and, and HHS, um, they, and, I, and I complain about the devotion of resources um, to uh, specific diseases and not improving the public health infrastructure, they, they constantly talk about the kind of dual-use capacity that is, that is you're, you're able to upgrade public health capacities by investments in flu or smallpox um, or anthrax. Uh, but in our book, we spend a lot of time showing why that is a fallacy and that, in fact, it diverts resources. And so um, I, I suppose if I had to answer quickly, I would say, uh, the Homeland Security Agency was the one, is the one that troubles me the most. Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, you touched uh, lightly on global justice and the issue of vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. um, can I we insinuate from that that possibly if we were successful in funding and producing enough vaccine for our population, 
we still may be asked to sacrifice some of that to other countries? Well, asked by who? <laughs> I should actually ask, yes, by asked by WHO who, yes. Um, I, 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 um, I, think, I, think it is, I think it is highly unlikely. Let me put it this way. Um, if, if you're in the throes of a real public health emergency where there, there's huge threat um, to populations, the economy, um, I believe that those countries that have um, that that have ownership over a vaccine um, capabilities, and where those vaccine manufacturers are operating in that country, will almost certainly um, not share with others. Uh, that's much different than should they share. Um, I think that they should. Uh, the United States is, is in an interesting position because we are the global power, um, and as the, the global power, we're in the most privileged position to protect ourselves, and so we might say, why should we share? But flu makes it really different, different than uh, most cases because we happen not to have the vaccine capacity in the United States. We're going to have to ask Europe and Asia and India <laughs> to help us if we want, want it then. Um, so uh, I think you're right. Realpolitik, um, the vaccine uh, goes to the country that's got it. Um, in the world of ethics, I think we need to spend more time thinking about the concept of global justice. That is, w why should it be that the, the rich have greater access to, to means to protect themselves in health, health emergencies. Uh, Professor, picking up on your uh, discussion of biosecurity under the rule of law. That's why I'm a judge and not a newscaster. Uh, pick, picking up on your discussion about uh, biosecurity under the rule of law, Given how emotional and divisive this whole area is, what suggestions do you have for our leaders and our institutions in promoting a more rational discussion and possibly some consensus? Well, um, if I knew the answer to that, <laughs> um, I should be president. <laughs> uh, it's a very, it's a, it's a very hard problem. I, I mean, I, I. Uh, my view is, is that we are, we are so politically divisive in the United States that neither side of the political divide seeks to find the common ground. Uh, and I think that in, in, in all matters there is common ground, but particularly in this matter there is common ground, because it must be true um, that those who um, believe in civil liberties also believe in our mutual health, safety, and security. And it must be true that those people who believe in our health, safety, and security um, embrace the Constitution and, and believe that, we, that we're uh, a country that abides by the rule of law. In that common ground, that's where we need to find a way um, to stop uh, yelling at each other uh, start listening and to divide some kind of a, a policy based upon uh, what, what, we, what are in our common interests. We don't have to agree entirely, um, but I think that we need to find some areas where we have some substantial agreement. but I have a hard time understanding a country like we got and the resources like we got, <clears throat> why do we have to depend on these other countries for this serum or whatever we're going to have to counteract this with? Why aren't we pumping it out and getting stuff going and wait? Why do we have to wait for them or beg for them to get it? What, what seems to be the problem there? I th well, um, the Institute of Medicine has been saying, talking about this problem for many, many years. 
I think the, I think the problem is, is that, um, the, that, we, that we, we have been very successful developing vaccines and pharmaceuticals through a market-based approach that is letting the free market um, develop these kinds of technologies. And that's made us a leader in you know, issues of, of cancer and HIV AIDS and other kinds of heart disease and the like. But the markets for bio, to fight against uh, agents of bioterrorism and agents of uh, naturally occurring infectious diseases are so um, uh, variable with so many uncertainties, market uncertainties, liability uncertainties, that by leaving it to the private market, um, we don't get the job done. That is, the, the, the private market is not interested um, in ramping up for that because they they don't know whether the event will occur. If the event doesn't occur, they don't get anything. And so it really requires public-private partnerships, um, which is what we've been saying for at least a decade now about what we need to do uh, rather than purely private enterprise. Uh, I think the government's starting to get that idea, but they're getting it in a way that is always looking at yesterday rather than tomorrow. It frustrates me. Um, you know, when we have um, somebody that goes on a plane and they have a shoe and a bomb in their shoe, from now on, our, everybody takes their shoes off at the airport. Um, if we have um, the thought that Saddam might have smallpox, even though it's eradicated, we spend all of our money on finding a vaccine for smallpox. Um, it, now with influenza, it goes on and on. We don't seem to be able to look to tomorrow to a broad range of risks to develop public-private partnerships to actually to respond to those risks uh, in ways that seems obvious and intelligent to me. But maybe I'm wrong. Thank you so much for that